Good to have you here this morning. Uh, Once again, if you would please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 18. There was a man by the name of Roger Sims. He was just getting out of the army. He was in his uniform, and the only way he could really get home at this time was thumb. How many of you have ever thumbed? Raise your hand. All right. You know the feeling then. I've done that too. Another confession in front of my mom. So anyway, he decided to thumb, and a Cadillac started coming by, and he thought, there's no way this guy's gonna, uh, gonna pull over. But sure enough, he did. Came in a jet black Cadillac, brand new. And the fellow said, come on in, son. Where are you headed? He says, I'm on my way to Chicago. Roger Sims says, well, I'm not quite going that far, but I'm going in that direction. He said, well, great. Glad for the company. Let's ride along. So Roger Sims and this man, a Mr. Hanover, started heading towards Chicago and they started talking and talked about all kinds of things. Roger Sims was a Christian. And he thought, you know, sometime or another, I I need to give this man the gospel. Well, they got about a half hour away from where he was going to be getting off out of this man's car. And finally he said, Mr. Hanover, there's something I'd like to share with you. You see, I'm a Christian. And he went on to give Mr. Hanover the gospel. True story. All of a sudden, the man pulled over and he thought, oh man, I've made him mad. He's going to kick me out of the car. But instead, Mr. Hanover bowed his head and in tears trusted Christ as his Savior. He thanked him. He said, this has been the greatest day of my life. And Mr. Hanover drove off. About five years went by. Roger Sims got married. He and his wife had a little son, and he started his own business. There happened to be a particular time that Roger needed to go to Chicago. And he came across the business card that Mr. Hanover had given him, Hanover Enterprises. So he flew into Chicago, and while he was there, he decided he would drop by, he'd see Mr. Hanover, just see how things are going. So he came into the office, and he met the lady, this receptionist there in the front office, and he said, please, if you could, my name's Roger Sims. I, I, I met Mr. Sim, or Mr. Hanover some time ago. Could I possibly see him? And the receptionist said, well, you can't meet him, but you can meet his wife. And he thought, that's kind of unusual. So he was escorted into the office, and there was a lady that was there in her 50s. And he said, ma'am, I came across your husband about five years ago. Uh, and, and I just wanted to see how things were going with him. And she said, when was that that you saw him? Well, he said, well, it was May 7th. I'll never forget it. It was the day I got out of the army. She started to cry. And he thought, oh, boy, what, 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 do, I, what do I do? He said, ma'am, I, I think there's something that you need to know. I'm, I'm a Christian. And... I gave the gospel to your husband that day. And then she started to really cry. She said, my husband was killed in a car accident right after he dropped you off. She said, I prayed for years that he would trust Christ as his Savior. And when he was killed, I gave up on God. I haven't been to church since. I haven't, I haven't worshiped since. She didn't know that he had trusted Christ as Savior. Now, you know, I love that story for a couple of reasons. Number one, it teaches me about prayer, the importance of prayer, and never giving up on prayer. Secondly, it teaches me something about never giving up on God, because God is faithful all the time. Amen? There's a program on Sunday nights called 60 Minutes. The fellow that 
created that started 60 Minutes. His name was Don Hewitt. Don Hewitt at one time was speaking to a group of people, and he gave his philosophy, as it were, when it comes to journalism, and he said this, My philosophy is simple. It's what little kids say to their parents, Mom, Dad, tell me a story. Even the people, and this, these are the words of Don Hewitt, even the people who wrote the Bible knew that when you deal with issues, you tell stories. He said, the issue was evil. The story was Noah. Now see, that's the case in the Bible. We wind up reading in Scripture stories, but they're not just there to hear a story. Right now, the children are getting ready in junior church to hear a story. I I don't know what they're going to be hearing, but they're going to hear a story about the Lord Jesus. The story is there to teach an issue, the love of God, the salvation that we have in Christ, the character of God in one way or another. It's about getting to an issue. It's about, when we read in Scripture, convincing the heart and the mind of the hearer about the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, what you can do with God, this is how and why He loves you, and this is how and why you can trust Him. Now, the theme or the topic or the issue, if you will, that we've been looking at the last few weeks has been about trusting God. That you can trust God. In fact, you can trust Him to do the impossible. Not limiting the Lord by our own perceptions concerning our limitations. If I can't do it, well, then it must not be able to be done. No, 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 no. God can do anything. In fact, all things are possible to him that believeth. That's what we learned. And then understanding that the Lord will not be bound by nature, which, by the way, he created. Not bound by nature, but absolutely unbound by his power. Now, these have been the stories. There have been three of them. Number one, when the disciples were on the lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, and the storm came up, and Jesus came walking to them on water. So there was, number one, the storm. Number two, there was the feeding of the 5,000. Number three, there was the father of the demon-possessed little boy that was seeking deliverance. Well, like I said, we've got one more story to tell, and we've read it here. Now, this is what I pray. I pray that the story gets into our hearts and minds, and listen to me, our very character. Because this is what the issue is that we are seeking to learn, or let's put it this way, that we ought to learn. We have the God of the impossible. And that's why the Apostle Paul can say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, are you all still in the auditorium? Have you already gone someplace else? All right. But before we get into the passage, before we get into it, let's consider our lives today. Now, just remember, remember this, please. Just like the disciples, remember the simple outline that we gave this, Just like the disciples, you may find the Lord, number one, creating a setting in your life. The first setting that we looked at was the disciples being sent out on the water into the Sea of Galilee. The second setting was the thousands that were there that needed to be fed, and Jesus came and approached the disciples about that. The third setting was the nine disciples that were with the crowd while the three were coming down from the mount with Christ, and there was a confrontation going on. That's the setting. Then there came by the Lord's hand the creating of a crisis. Now I want to stop right there. Even though this isn't a big crowd, the fact of the matter is there's probably more than one person here right now that is in the middle of a crisis. There's a situation 
that you can't handle or you're having difficulty with and you don't know what to do. I want you to know something God does. You see, my God knows the end from the beginning. He didn't create us to wreck us. If He saved us, if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, guess what? My Father runs the universe. It's absolutely off the charts. When I go riding my bike up on the north side of the county, just on the other side of the county line, I love looking at the trees and the sky, the river that's right there. I love it because my Savior, my God and Savior created it. I am not going to buy in to the big lie. I know he who handles the truth. But if I wind up in a crisis, there is something that I desperately need him to do. I need to understand and remember that he has already shown himself faithful in those times. For instance, the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had an answer. The command by the Lord for the disciples to feed the multitude. There's a crisis. Lord, how are we going to do this? And then the father, again, with the demon-possessed son. So I ask you, is there a crisis in your life right now, or is the, is there a, the, the potential for one? Now remember, that's not where these stories ended. That's not where they ended. There was the coming of the Savior. One way or another, the Lord comes into situations that he has allowed to happen. Did you hear that? When there is something that takes place, God is not absent. Listen, do you realize that God never takes time off? He says, Lo, I am with you always. He that watcheth over thee, the Bible says, shall not slumber nor sleep. He is as much awake when we're asleep as when we're awake. One way or another, the Lord comes. He either calms the storm, feeds the multitude, or delivers those who need deliverance. Hear that out. Be assured that Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, is still in the habit. He is still in the habit because he's taught us the issue is trusting him. He is still in the habit of bringing himself into our situations. How do I know that? He taught us that. And we're going to see one more story. So let's get into it. Look at 18, Luke 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, for this purpose. You see... He's letting us know there's a reason why he's telling this story. What's the story? That men ought always to what? Pray and not to what? Faint. Listen, one of the things we're learning here right now is prayer is not an option. Are you listening? Prayer is not an option. It's a duty. You see the word ought? That word, that Greek word that translates means it is necessary. Thayer says there is a need of it. It is right and proper. It's right and proper to pray. Our God wants us talking to Him. That is something that is a great comfort to me because you know what? We've got all kinds of people that need prayer. You need, do you know people that need God's work in their lives? Say amen. amen. There's a reason. He says we ought to pray. Because we are ever dealing with, listen, we are ever dealing with impossible situations. Somebody that needs salvation, somebody that needs a job, somebody that needs deliverance, somebody that needs something. We're always involved in that. In fact, the word always is our focus here. It's our focus. Now look, men ought always to pray. Always doesn't mean that we pray every single moment. That's not what it means. It means that we're faithful in prayer. It's something that's always happening. Always means that we should pray in both good times and bad. You don't just save yourself for the prayer closet when your life is imploding. You don't do that. Again, the prayer closet is for any time. It's for all time. Thirdly, always means we should always be in the spirit of prayer. The man that founded Maranatha Baptist Bible College. He said this, and he'd get his glasses and he'd do like this. 
He'd say, Christians ought to be ready to do three things at all times. They ought to be ready to preach, pray, or die. Well, I, praise God, I'm ready to die because the Lord is my Savior. I got ready to preach this for this morning. And I'm ready to pray. Lord, help us to hear this. I'm praying. I'm praying. Because when you get in the Word of God and you recognize the days that we live in, and that there are people that are still unsure about Christ, we need to pray. There are times that, you know, we need to understand that God is seeking us. Sometimes those prayers are too late. Excuse me, sometimes those times are too late, I should say. But praise God when God does a work. I was with a young man in prison Thursday night up on the eighth floor in the, in the, in the jailhouse here in Sacramento County. He was so hungry for the Word of God, we had a ball. I mean, we're on the phone talking to each other, you know, fist bumping each other through the glass, praising God for what he, he had his Bible with him. I'm so glad for that. I just wish he'd done it 10 years before. And by the way, he does too. But he's got it now. He's got it now. And praise God, I can't wait to see what God has done in his life. There's some more I want to tell you about that. I'll tell you about it tonight. Just great. But listen, we can't quit. Now, now you're listening? Hello? We can't quit. We can't quit praying. Listen, if we quit praying for souls... Souls die and go to hell. And my Bible talks about a place called hell. And you might not believe it, or somebody might not believe it, but that doesn't close the door or put the fire out. It absolutely does not. We can't quit. If we quit praying, our nation is doomed. Our nation is doomed. We've got to remember that. Look, I'm not trying to give us a guilt trip, okay? But I'm telling you, our God is powerful enough to deliver a nation. Amen? Amen. The reason why our nation is in the situation that it's, that it's in is not because of liberals. It's not. It's not because of the entertainment industry. It's not because of bad politicians. It's because God's people, are you ready for it? Here it comes. God's people quit praying. God's people quit being like God's people. Because if one can put a thousand to flight and two can put ten thousand to flight, then we've got a power by God's grace that we've given up on. Now you say, well, you know, it's just, it's prophecy and this is what was going to happen. I want you to listen to the rest of this message. So the Lord, listen, the Lord gives us a story here and it's everything we need. See? Peter cried out, Lord, save me. The disciples asked, what do we do? The father asked, Lord, if you can do anything, help us. You know what all those three things are called? They're called prayer. They're called asking God. They're called seeking Him. So, now with that first verse, let's get to the plot. Look at verse 2. Saying, there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. So we've got two people in the plot here. Number one, we've got a wicked judge. Number two, a wronged widow. Concerning the judge, the description fits. He was probably with the ACLU of his day. Bribes, political correctness, personal ambition, those were probably the stars that he steered by. Now concerning the widow, Lockyer, Herbert Lockyer said this, In our Lord's time, widows were somewhat despised and a prey for unprincipled men. Widows in Bible days often became quickly destitute when their husbands died. There was no such thing as life insurance. If they had any possessions... There would be greedy people, there would be crafty people that would come along and try to rip them off, basically, is what we would say today. Now, she's a picture. She's a picture of believers today on earth. Because in this time, listen, we're not loved, we're hated, we're despised. The word came, 
is in the imperfect. You see what it says there, that the widow came to the judge. It's in the imperfect. In other words, what it mean is, means is she came, and then she came again, and then she came again, and again, and again, and again, and again. You see the word avenge there. The word avenge doesn't mean that she wanted her adversary punished. It simply meant, do me justice, deliver me, protect me, Robertson says. Her main goal was to have the judge deliver her from the oppression that she was going through. Now understand, here's a wicked judge, here's a widow, and again, widows at that time were not looked upon favorably, they were not treated well many times. And she needed help. There was one person that could help her. Somebody that had to do with the law. And so she came. And she came again and again and again. Look at verse 4. And he would not for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But afterward he said within himself. Now stop and think. He just The Lord's telling us what is going through this man's heart. He says, though I fear not God, nor regard man. Listen, the judge was proving out to be exactly what Christ said. He was a scumbag. Again, he was on the, he was on the take. If you gave him money, he would help you. Otherwise, forget it. So he resisted. And he resisted. She came, he resisted. She came again, he resisted. But then he says this, verse five. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming, she weary me. Now, I love doing word studies. This is good. The word translate troubleth means, in this case, he was big time annoyed. She kept coming. Nobody would lock the door. She's walking in. She walks in again. She walks in again. I'm tired of this. She won't bribe me. I can't do anything but hear her out. Now the thing is, conscience is not speaking to this fellow. It's the disturbance of the woman. Won't somebody get this lady out of here? You see the word weary there? This is good. That word weary literally meant to beat black and blue. Now it's not that she's coming in and beating the fire out of the guy. But verbally speaking... (laughs) She's given him fits. I mean, she's, we might say today, she's in his face. She is absolutely positively making a nuisance of herself. And you know what? I think she knew it. And she wasn't going to quit. Because he was the only help she could get. She's a widow. There's no family, nothing going on. What am I going to do? And somebody's trying to rip me off. And those two things motivated the judge. She's wearying me. She's beating me verbally to death on this thing. That's the plot of the story. Now Jesus comes with the parallel. Look at verse 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. Now, have you ever noticed that there's a whole lot of noise around us? I mean, sometimes you'll walk into a place and they've got a, they've got a stereo going or they got a radio going. And then we wind up going to somebody's house and maybe the television's on. There's a lot of noise in our culture. Sometimes if we're going to hear something out, we've got to stop ourselves or somebody has to stop us and say, listen, I'm trying to make a point. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like, if somebody grabs you by the face and says, now look, hear me out in this. This is what Christ is doing. He says, hear what the unjust judge saith. Now usually the Lord would not draw attention to somebody wicked. But he's trying to teach us something. Look at verse 7. And shall not God avenge, same word, Shall not God avenge his own elect? How many of you have trusted Christ as your Savior? Say amen. Amen. That's you. Jesus, through the pages of his word, is saying, would you please hear me out? Listen up. 
Hear me out. Shall not God judge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? If the unjust judge finally granted the widow her request, will not God, this is what Christ is saying, will not God do the same for the saints? You're a child of God. If you've trusted Christ, if there's been a time that you recognize that you were a sinner, you can't save yourself. And it wasn't that you prayed a prayer, but in your heart, you put your trust in Him. He says, listen, You belong to me. If the unjust judge will do that to get that annoying lady out of his life, don't you think God will hear you? Well, the understood answer is, yes, it's a strong affirmative, absolutely, though he bear long with them. The implied truth is that if anyone is going to help the needy, it will be God. One commentator put it like this, The great point in this parable is this. If a bad man will yield to the mere force of importunity which he hates, how much more certainly will a righteous God be prevailed on by the faith and believing prayers of those he loves? Hello? Praise God for that. God hears differently than the unjust judge. You see the word cry, though they cry day and night? It indicates an earnest and loud cry for help. God does so to give time for work in our hearts. See, though he bear long with them. You know, the question that we've got to ask ourselves, now, now Lord, help, help me out in this, Lord. There has been something that I've been praying for. Lord, it hasn't been weeks. It hasn't been months. It's been years. In fact, in some situations... There might be people here, I'm one of them, who has been praying about something for decades. Question, why does God not, boom, answer? There's several reasons why. Number one, the Lord is seeking to work in our hearts. You know, as we go more and more to Him, actually our faith can strengthen. Our faith can strengthen because the Lord does a job in us. Secondly, how many of you are glad that God hasn't always answered your prayers? Raise your hand. If I, if I did that, if, if I, if I had my prayer answered, every prayer answered that I prayed, number one, I'd be married to the wrong person right now. I'd be married to the wrong person. I'm glad God shows us that sometimes We don't really need what we're praying for. While I was riding my bike last night, I was listening to a message by Dr. John Getch. He said he was talking to a pastor about this thing of prayer. And he said, this pastor said, we have gotten into a situation in our church where we're landlocked. I mean, there's just nothing to do. We're squeezed in. And we need, we needed another place to build the church. He said, we found a beautiful piece of property. And we prayed. He said, our church saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. We went to the, we went to the property and we prayed over the property as a church. And we prayed and we prayed and nothing. And we prayed and we prayed and nothing. I fasted. I prayed, Lord, why aren't you doing something? Nothing. And then the exit next to the piece of property that they were going to build on was closed permanently off the freeway, chopped off. It had been in the planning stages for a long time. The pastor didn't take the time to find out about it. The nearest exit where people could have come in to get to the church was now going to be three miles away. He said, Brother Getch, if God had given us that property, it would have been an impossible situation. Now, how many of you believe that God knows what He's doing? Amen? You see, when we come 
one of the first things that the Lord teaches us about prayer is in the Sermon on the Mount. Thy kingdom come, what's the next phrase? Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Now, God has said He hears our prayers. He's teaching us right here how to walk, as it were, on water with Christ. But you know what? Sometimes we wind up floundering like Peter did. And so what happens? We start to doubt. We start to really wonder if God knows what He's doing. Lord, i got this situation in my life. I'm pounding away. My head hurts. I keep hitting this wall. Lord, aren't, what are you going to turn this wall into a door? The answer is God turns doors, turns walls into doors, but it might not be the wall that you're pounding away at. We need to trust Him. Watch this. Look at the verse 8. I tell you that He will avenge them speedily. I want you to notice this. Number one, it says, He will. That's called certainty, isn't it? Not He might, not He may be, He will. But now wait a minute, you've got to keep asking. You've got to keep seeking. That's what the lady was doing, right? Now look, remember when Christ said, Hear what the unjust judge saith? And the reason why He's telling us this prayer, that men ought always to pray and not to... Let me ask you something. Have you ever gone to the point where you wanted to give up? That's what that word faint means. We want to give up hope. Hello? I'm telling you right here and right now, this last week, this last week, I don't know how many other people got it, but the way the last Sunday sermon ended was the thing that was the biggest thing for me. When Jesus told that, told the disciples about the demon in that little boy, this kind cometh not out but by what? Prayer and? You see, this is what we're thinking. We're thinking, ah, this is every day, come and go. No big deal. Lord bless us. Lord help us out. No, 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 no. This is why we're studying what we're studying on Sunday nights. Tonight we're looking at the shield of faith. I mean, this is warfare. This is drop down, drag out, yeah, I mean, you know, fisticuffs kind of thing. Spiritually speaking, people are living and dying without Jesus Christ. And Christians are struggling with what is truth. Is God really who He said He was? Will He keep His promises? The answer is yes. But you know what? It's going to take some real earnest prayer, some real sacrifice to get through this time. You want to know what it's going to be like? Get into the book of Acts. Get into the book of Acts. We've already got the unjust judges. We've got Supreme Court judges that are bringing out law out of thin air. I'll guarantee you there's more law that they're going to bring out of thin air, and it's going to fly right into the face of our worship. They want us to keep this Bible and our stinking religion in these four walls, but once you go out there, you better shut up about it. And oh, by the way, if you're a baker, you better make that cake. We need to pray. We'd better pray. Otherwise, there are going to be people that are going to be giving up and going out, just like that lady that gave up on God. God, you didn't hear my prayer for five years. Walked away from God. He didn't keep His promise. I prayed for my husband. I prayed for him. I wanted him saved. Same thing happened to evangelist Phil Schuler. Got out of the military right after World War II was writing his brother, who was in the Navy, giving him the gospel time again and again and again, and then found out one day that he'd been killed in combat. Phil Sh or excuse me, Glenn Shunk was crushed. That was Glenn Shunk. Fifteen years went by. Fifteen. 
Glenn Schunk flew into a city one time. He was going to hold evangelistic campaigns. And he got off the plane, and there was a lady and her husband that was standing there waiting for him. The lady came up and grabbed him and gave him a big hug, and the fella came in. They had a group hug kind of thing, and he thought, what in the world is going on? The lady, it turns out, had been dating his brother back during World War II. And she brought out a yellowed, yellowed paper and showed a letter from Glenn Shunk's brother talking about how one day he was up on deck sunning himself and a godly sailor came up and led him to Christ before he died. God is good. But now listen, you've got to keep on praying. And I'm telling you here, right now, listen to me. If you walk out of this building thinking little or nothing about prayer, be sure your sin will find you out. But Lord, I thought, no, no, no. Pray without ceasing, the Scripture tells us. Amen? Amen. You see, this, this, if it doesn't convince us, then we're going to be like Peter. We're going to start to sink. We're going to look around at the thousands that need to be fed, and we're going to start to panic. We're going to be like the dad who is absolutely in a panic about his little child but doesn't have enough sense to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You see the word speedily there? That doesn't mean that he's going to do it right away. It means that when he does it, boom, it's done. When it happens, it will happen suddenly. And there it will be, and God will answer And you think, my soul, where in the world, why was I doubting? But I want you to see, lastly, the problem. Look at what Christ says. Nevertheless, now understand, who is it that's saying this? Who is it? Who? Come on, don't 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 be shy. Who is saying this? Jesus. The Lord is saying this. He is looking us in the eye from 2,000 years ago. And he is saying, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find... Now listen, that word faith in the Greek literally means this. That kind of faith. Whose kind of faith? The widow. The widow. He's looking and he's saying, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Now, you you know what he's implying? there's not going to be much of it. You know what Christ is saying to us? I wonder if those who are alive when I come will have the faith I told them they can possess. I wonder if they listened. I wonder that if they went to Luke 18 and they read my words, I wonder if they listened and said, you know what, I will. I will. I wonder if they listened and took heed when they sat down on July 26th in Faith Baptist and they heard the word. I wonder if they believed it. I wonder if they decided they would have that kind of faith. I wonder if they'll get out of the boat like Peter did. I wonder if they will trust me in seeming impossible situations like the feeding of thousands. I wonder. I wonder if they'll, they will still come, even though their faith is small. I wonder if they'll simply say, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. I wonder if they'll do like the lady, if they'll ask and keep on asking. See, in fact, the Lord told us that elsewhere. Ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, every one that knocketh, it shall be opened to him. When it says ask, seek and find, it means ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. Just keep doing it. Just keep coming. 
Yeah, but that's a nuisance. The Lord just told you something about yourself then. You don't have the faith of the widow woman. It will, tump, it will come. It will take place. Remember what we learned? Don't ask, am I able to do this thing that God has called me to do? Can I do this? No, no. Ask yourself, is God able to do through me what he calls me to do? If that is the case, then guess what? We have the faith of the widow woman. Look, as you're going to see as we get into 1 Corinthians starting next Sunday, we, 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 when, when we get together here, we, you've got a preacher and you've got people, but you've got the Word of God open, and that's the key, is the Holy Spirit being allowed to flow through. Is the Holy Spirit teaching you right now, listen, hear what the unjust judge saith. Hear what he says, and understand that I'm not like the unjust judge. I am God, righteous, holy, merciful, loving, caring. I wonder if Christ will find us like the widow woman. I hope we don't wind up in a situation where, like the father we saw last week, came to Christ and said, I came to your disciples. You know, they had the power that you had to cast out demons, and they could not. And so the disciples came to Christ and said, what was wrong? Why could we not cast him out? And Christ said, this kind came forth by nothing. This kind can come forth not by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. Remember again what we heard last week. The desire and work and will of Christ is to build faith, not bash it. Ephesians 2.10 For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto good works. Will they make fun of us? Oh yeah. Years ago there was a a godly man, a godly preacher and teacher by the name of F.B. Meyer. He was on an ocean liner crossing the Atlantic and they asked him to speak on the subject of answered prayer. And so he did. There was an agnostic that was there and he listened in and when he was leaving, somebody said, did, what did you think of what Mr. Meyer spoke about? And the agnostic said, ha, I didn't believe a word of it. That afternoon, there was going to be another lecture by F.B. Meyer. And this agnostic thought, I'm going to go hear this guy again, this babbler, he called him, to hear what he has to say. While he was walking, he had a couple of oranges with him. And he walked by, and there was an elderly lady in a chair, kind of leaned back, and she was asleep, and her hands were kind of like this. He thought he's going to have some fun. So... He took the oranges and he put them in her hands and then quickly walked away. Later on, he saw the lady and she was just happy as all get out. She's eating one of the oranges. And he said, ma'am, you know, what's, what's going on? Why are you so happy? She says, I am just so glad what my father has done for me. And he said, your father, he's still alive? Oh, he's alive forevermore. She said, I was sick. And I was praying. I was asking God, Lord, give me an orange. I need something that will help me. I've been sick for the last several days. And I woke up and he gave me two oranges. The guy didn't know what to say. Except a couple of days later when he trusted Christ. Listen, this is what I pray we wind up walking away with. For four Sundays now, walking with Christ on water, this is what I hope and pray that, that, that we've learned, and I want to encourage you in this. Number one, wherever you are in your life, recognize the presence of the Savior. Lo, I am with you always, 
even unto the end of the age. Recognize the presence of the Savior. If you're truly saved, if you're not truly saved, you need to be saved before this day is out. I say that without apology. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. People need Christ. My, my Bible is coming to pass. Can you believe the prophecy that we've seen coming together? By the way, do you know what's happening next month? The Pope is getting together here in America and going to be working more towards the one world religion. Meanwhile, they're already talking more and more about the one world government at the UN. Our Bible's coming to pass. I see people reading stuff. I know what's happening. Jesus is going to win. Number one, number one, recognize the presence of the Savior. Number two, don't fear the fear. Fear will start creeping up. Listen, that's your flesh talking to you. God is good. Don't fear the fear. Number three, respond to His voice. Like the disciples did. Be not afraid, it is I. Hey, wherewithal shall these these, uh, buy bread? See, he's there. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Listen, respond to his voice. Even if it's, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Are you listening? Number four, trust in His power. Go back to the book of Hebrews 11 if you need to. Do it. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Moses. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of this person, this person, this person, this person, who by faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness. And lastly, if you falter, look again. If you start to sink, look again. Like Peter did. Look again. Like the dad did. He came. He didn't walk away from the disciples and say, that's it, I knew he was a phony. He wound up coming to Christ. Look again. And again, and again, and again, and again. And let's pray.